Hello and welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jay and this is a web of classic tales. If you're enjoying the videos, please like, subscribe, and share. If you want notifications every single time a new video is uploaded, please click on the little bell icon. Today we will continue reading Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey. In spite of Udolpho and the dressmaker, however, the party from Pulteney Street reached the upper rooms in very good time. The Thorpes and James Morland were there only two minutes before them, and Isabella, having gone through the usual ceremonial of meeting her friend with the most smiling and affectionate haste, of admiring the set of her gown and envying the curl of her hair, they followed their chaperones arm in arm into the ballroom, whispering to each other whenever a thought occurred and supplying the place of many ideas by a squeeze of the hand or a smile of affection. The dancing began with a few minutes after they were seated, and James, who had been engaged quite as long as his sister, was very importunate with Isabella to stand up. But John was gone into the card room to speak to a friend, and nothing, she declared, could induce her to join the set before her dear Catherine could join it too. I assure you, said she, I would not stand up without your dear sister for all the world, for if I did, we should certainly be separated the whole evening. Catherine accepted this kindness with gratitude, and they continued as they were for three minutes longer, when Isabella, who had been talking to James on the other side of her, turned again to his sister and whispered, My dear creature, I am afraid I must leave you. Your brother is so amazingly impatient to begin. I know you will not mind my going away, and I dare say John will be back in a moment, and then you may easily find me out. Catherine, though a little disappointed, had too much good nature to make any opposition, and the others rising up, Isabella had only time to press her friend's hand and say, "'Goodbye, my dear love,' before they hurried off. The younger Miss Thorpe's being also dancing, Catherine was left to the mercy of Mrs. Thorpe and Mrs. Allen, between whom she now remained. She could not help being vexed at the non-appearance of Mr. Thorpe, for she not only longed to be dancing, but was likewise aware that, as the real dignity of her situation could not be known, she was sharing with the scores of other young ladies still sitting down all the credit of wanting a partner. To be disgraced in the eye of the world, to wear the appearance of infamy while her heart is all purity, her actions all innocence, and the misconduct of another the true source of her debasement, is one of those circumstances which peculiarly belongs to the heroine's life, and her fortitude under it what particularly dignifies her character. Catherine had fortitude too. She suffered, but no murmur passed her lips. From this state of humiliation, she was roused at the end of ten minutes to a pleasanter feeling by seeing not Mr. Thorpe, but Mr. Tilney, within three yards of the place where they sat. He seemed to be moving that way, but he did not see her, and therefore the smile and the blush which his sudden reappearance raised in Catherine passed away without sullying her heroic importance. He looked as handsome and as lively as ever, and was talking with interest to a fashionable and pleasing-looking young woman, who leant on his arm and whom Catherine immediately guessed to be his sister, thus unthinkingly throwing away a fair opportunity of considering him lost to her forever by being married already. But guided by what was simple and probable, it had never entered her head that Mr. Tilney could be married. He had not behaved. He had not talked like the married men to whom she had been used. He had never mentioned a wife, and he acknowledged a sister. From these circumstances sprang the instant conclusion of his sister's now being by his side. And, therefore, instead of turning a death-like paleness and falling in a fit on Mrs. Allen's bosom, Catherine sat erect, in the perfect use of her senses, and with cheeks only a little redder than usual. Mr. Tilney and his companion, who continued, though slowly, to approach, were immediately preceded by a lady, an acquaintance of Mrs. Thorpe, and this lady stopped to speak to her. They, as belonging to her, stopped likewise, and Catherine, catching Mr. Tilney's eye, instantly received from him the smiling tribute of recognition. She returned it with pleasure, and then advancing still nearer, he spoke both to her and Mrs. Allen, by whom he was very civilly acknowledged. I am very happy to see you again, sir, indeed, and I was afraid you had left Bath. He thanked her for her fears, and said he had quitted it for a week, on the very morning after his having had the pleasure of seeing her. Well, sir, and I dare say you are not sorry to be back again, for it is just the place for young people, and indeed for everybody else, too. I tell Mr. Allen, when he talks of being sick of it, that I am sure he should not complain, for it is so very agreeable a place, that it is much better to be here than at home at this dull time of year. I tell him he is quite in luck to be sent here for his health. And I hope, madame, that Mr. Allen will be obliged to like the place, from finding it of service to him. Him. Thank you, sir. I have no doubt that he will. A neighbour of ours, Dr. Skinner, was here for his health last winter and came away quite stout. That circumstance must give great encouragement. Yes, sir, and Dr. Skinner and his family were here three months, so I tell Mr. Allen he must not be in a hurry to get away. 
Here they were interrupted by a request from Mrs. Thorpe to Mrs. Allen that she would move a little to accommodate Mrs. Hughes and Miss Tilney with seats, as they had agreed to join their party. This was accordingly done, Mr. Tilney still continuing standing before them, and after a few minutes' consideration, he asked Catherine to dance with him. This compliment, delightful as it was, produced severe mortification to the lady, and in giving her denial, she expressed her sorrow on the occasion so very much as if she really felt it that had Thorpe, who joined her just afterwards, been half a minute earlier, he might have thought her sufferings rather too acute. The very easy manner in which he then told her that he had kept her waiting did not by any means reconcile her more to her lot, nor did the particulars which he entered into while they were standing up, of the horses and dogs of the friend whom he had just left, and of a proposed exchange of terriers between them, interest her so much as to prevent her looking very often towards the part of the room where she had left Mr. Tilney. Of her dear Isabella, to whom she particularly longed to point out that gentleman, she could see nothing. They were in different sets. She was separated from all her party and away from all her acquaintance. One mortification succeeded another, and from the whole she deduced this useful lesson, that to go previously engaged to a ball does not necessarily increase either the dignity or enjoyment of a young lady. From such a moralizing strain as this, she was suddenly roused by a touch on the shoulder, and turning round, perceived Mrs. Hughes directly behind her, attended by Miss Tilney and a gentleman. I beg your pardon, Miss Moreland, said she, for this liberty, but I cannot anyhow get to Miss Thorpe, and Mrs. Thorpe said she was sure you would not have the least objection to letting in this young lady by you. Mrs. Hughes could not have applied to any creature in the room more happy to oblige her than Catherine. The young ladies were introduced to each other, Miss Tilney expressing a proper sense of such goodness, Miss Moreland with the real delicacy of a generous mind making light of the obligation, and Mrs. Hughes, satisfied with having so respectably settled her young charge, returned to her party. Miss Tilney had a good figure, a pretty face, and a very agreeable countenance, and her hair, though it had not all the decided pretension, the resolute stylishness of Miss Thorpe's, had more real elegance. Her manners showed good sense and good breeding. They were neither shy nor affectedly open, and then she seemed capable of being young, attractive, and at a ball, without wanting to fix the attention of every man near her, and without exaggerated feelings of ecstatic delight or inconceivable vexation on every little trifling occurrence. Catherine, interested at once by her appearance and her relationship to Mr. Tilney, was desirous of being acquainted with her, and readily talked, therefore, whenever she could think of anything to say, and had courage and leisure for saying it but the hindrance thrown in the way of a very speedy intimacy, by the frequent want of one or more of these requisites, prevented their doing more than going through the first rudiments of an acquaintance, by informing themselves how well the other liked Bath, how much she admired its buildings and surrounding country, whether she drew or played or sang, and whether she was fond of riding on horseback. The two dances were scarcely concluded before Catherine found her arm gently seized by her faithful Isabella, who in great spirits exclaimed, At last I have got you, my dearest creature. I have been looking for you this hour. What could induce you to come into this set when you knew I was in the other? I have been quite wretched without you. My dear Isabella, how was it possible for me to get at you? I could not even see where you were. So I told your brother all the time, but he would not believe me. Do go and see for her, Mr. Morland, said I, but all in vain. He would not stir an inch. Was not it so, Mr. Morland? But you men are all so immoderately lazy. I have been scolding him to such a degree, my dear Catherine. You would be quite amazed. You know I never stand upon ceremony with such people. Look at that young lady with the white beads round her head, whispered Catherine, detaching her friend from James. It is Mr. Tilney's sister. Oh, goodness, you don't say so. Let me look at her this moment. What a delightful girl. I never saw anything half so beautiful. But where is her all-conquering brother? Is he in the room? Point him out to me this instant if he is. I die to see him. Mr. Morland, you are not to listen. We are not talking about you. But what is all this whispering about? What is going on? There now, I knew how it would be. You men have such restless curiosity. Talk of the curiosity of women indeed. Tis nothing. But be satisfied, for you are not to know anything at all of the matter. And is that likely to satisfy me, do you think? Well, I declare I never knew anything like you. What can it signify to you what we are talking of? Perhaps we are talking about you. Therefore, I would advise you not to listen. Or you may happen to hear something not very agreeable. In this commonplace chatter, which lasted some time, the original subject seemed entirely forgotten. And though Catherine was very well pleased to have it dropped for a while, she could not avoid a little suspicion at the total suspension of all Isabella's impatient desire to see Mr. Dilney. When the orchestra struck up a fresh dance, James would have led his fair partner away, but she resisted. I tell you, Mr. Morland, she cried, I would not do such a thing for all the world. How can you be so teasing? 
only conceive, my dear Catherine, what your brother wants me to do. He wants me to dance with him again, though I tell him that it is a most improper thing and entirely against the rules. It would make us the talk of the place if we were not to change partners. Upon my honour, said James, in these public assemblies it is as often done as not. Nonsense! How can you say so? But when you men have a point to carry, you never stick at anything. My sweet Catherine, do support me. Persuade your brother how impossible it is. Tell him that it would quite shock you to see me do such a thing. Now would not it? No, not at all. But if you think it wrong, you had much better change. There, cried Isabella. You hear what your sister says, and yet you will not mind her. Well, remember that it is not my fault if we set all the old ladies in Bath a bustle. Come along, my dearest Catherine, for goodness sake, and stand by me. And off they went to regain their former place. John Thorpe, in the meanwhile, had walked away, and Catherine, ever willing to give Mr. Tilney an opportunity of repeating the agreeable request which had already flattered her once, made her way to Mrs. Allen and Mrs. Thorpe as fast as she could, in the hope of finding him still with them. A hope which, when it proved to be fruitless, she felt to have been highly unreasonable. Well, my dear, said Mrs. Thorpe, impatient for praise of her son, I hope you have had an agreeable partner. Very agreeable, madame. I am glad of it. John has charming spirits, has he not? Did you meet Mr. Tilney, my dear? said Mrs. Allen. No, where is he? He was with us just now, and said he was so tired of lounging about that he was resolved to go and dance, so I thought perhaps he would ask you if he met with you. Where can he be? said Catherine, looking round. But she had not looked round long before she saw him leading a young lady to the dance. Ah, he has got a partner. I wish he'd asked you, said Mrs. Allen, and after a short silence she added, he is a very agreeable young man. Indeed he is, Mrs. Allen, said Mrs. Thorpe, smiling complacently. I must say it, though I am his mother, that there is not a more agreeable young man in the world. This inapplicable answer might have been too much for the comprehension of many, but it did not puzzle Mrs. Allen, for after only a moment's consideration, she said in a whisper to Catherine, I dare say she thought I was speaking of her son. Catherine was disappointed and vexed. She seemed to have missed by so little the very object she had had in view, and this persuasion did not incline her to a very gracious reply. When John Thorpe came up to her soon afterwards and said, Well, Miss Moreland, I suppose you and I are to stand up and jig it together again. Oh no, I am much obliged to you. Our two dances are over, and besides, I am tired and do not mean to dance any more. Do not you? Then let us walk about and quiz people. Come along with me, and I will show you the four greatest quizzers in the room, my two younger sisters, and their partners. I have been laughing at them this half hour. Again, Catherine excused herself, and at last he walked off to quiz his sisters by himself. The rest of the evening she found very dull. Mr. Tilney was drawn away from their party at tea to attend that of his partner. Miss Tilney, though belonging to it, did not sit near her, and James and Isabella were so much engaged in conversing together that the latter had no leisure to bestow more on her friend than one smile, one squeeze, and one dearest Catherine. Thank you for listening. This has been Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, Chapter 8. I've been Jay. This is a web of classic tales. Please like, subscribe, and share. Click the bell icon for notifications. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Have a nice life, and I'll see you next time.